The Steiner brothers were one of professional wrestling's most popular tag teams during the late 80s and early 90s. With their impactful and intense wrestling style mixed with their amateur backgrounds, both Rick and Scott were extremely capable of capturing an audience's attention, which in turn led to some incredible success for the brothers. Showing off their skills in WCW, the WWE, ECW and New Japan Pro Wrestling, the Steiners, at one point, became arguably the hottest tag team in the business. In today's video, we take a look at the Steiner brothers in WCW. As a heads up, this video only covers the Steiners tag careers and not their solo runs. But of course, where needed, we will touch upon Rick and Scott's respective singles careers. The next video uploaded on this channel will go into the Steiners' time in the WWF, along with their return to World Championship Wrestling. Both Rick and Scott were involved in amateur wrestling at the University of Michigan. Rick and Scott were both NCAA qualifiers, with older brother Rick going on to establish the fastest pin in the school's history at just 15 seconds. Rick was introduced to pro wrestling by George the Animal Steel, and he got into the business right after leaving college. Scott would follow suit, however both brothers began their careers with different companies. Rick worked for the AWA, Canada's International Wrestling and the UWF, while Scott found work in the World Wrestling Association and in the Memphis-based CWA. Rick found his way to Jim Crockett Promotions in 1988 when the UWF was bought out by the company. In JCP, he became a member of the Varsity Club, a team who would brag about their wrestling superiority thanks to their college backgrounds. The first incarnation of the Varsity Club featured Mike Rotunda, Kevin Sullivan and Rick Steiner. However, it was only Rotunda and Steiner who had a legitimate amateur background, while Sullivan's claims were more kayfabe. Soon, there was dissension within the club, as both Sullivan and Rotunda felt that they were superior to Rick Steiner. Rick, meanwhile, was gaining fan support as he portrayed a dumb but lovable guy, someone who wouldn't break the rules as much as his teammates and was simply hanging around the wrong crowd. Eventually, Rick would leave the Varsity Club, culminating in a TV title match against Rotunda at Starcade 1988, which he won. This match is worth a watch if you want to see just how over Rick Steiner was. The crowd goes totally nuts when he secures the win. The Chai Town Rumble pay-per-view in 1989 featured a rematch between Rick and Mike Rotunda. This match featured Scott Steiner, who was in his brother's corner for the showdown. The match ended when Rick had a sleeper locked in and it appeared that Rotunda couldn't raise his arm for the third time, signalling a knockout. However, Rick lost as his shoulders were on the mat and the ref counted to three while he had Mike in the sleeper. The bigger story here though was Scott Steiner's introduction to WCW pay-per-view. With Missy Hyatt in their corner, Rick and Scott began teaming up together. Known as the Steiner Brothers, the team were pretty much instant fan favourites as they began climbing the ranks within WCW. The Steiners would work against the Varsity Club, which now included Steve Williams, and they had a match at the 1989 Great American Bash, which is well worth a look. It's a wild brawl with lots of weapons, short but exciting. Thanks to their dominating run, the Steiners got themselves a shot at the NWA tag titles held by the fabulous Freebirds at the 8th Clash of the Champions show in September of 1989. Robin Green cost the Steiners the match, which subsequently led to Green becoming Woman. Woman promised us that the Steiners would meet their doom at Halloween Havoc 1989, and at the pay-per-view, the tag team of Doom featuring Butch Reed and Ron Simmons was introduced by Woman. Doom went on to defeat the Steiners at Halloween Havoc. Even with these losses, the Steiners remained very popular with audiences. 
in Atlanta, Georgia, the Stanners eventually defeated the Freebirds for the NWA World Tag Team titles. The title change would air on the November 18th episode of World Championship Wrestling. They held the titles for around 6 months, eventually dropping the gold to Doom at Capital Combat 1990. This match comes recommended for sure. Not only does it once again show how over the Steiners were, but it also shows how much they had advanced in terms of their position on the card. The Steiners vs Doom, a near 20 minute tag team match, was the semi main event of this pay per view. It really can't be overstated how popular both Rick and Scott were. People loved their high impact wrestling style and I do feel that WCW was absolutely the right place for the Steiners to be during their early tag team career. While the WWF had a tremendous tag team division in their own right during this time period, the Steiners just seemed to fit into WCW extremely well in the early 90s. The Steiners may have been booked as an all dominating babyface team, but it worked because they were so good in the ring. Rick and Scott would walk down the ramp and just beat the hell out of their opponents with various suplexes and clotheslines while the crowd roared with approval. During the summer of 1990, the Steiners defeated the Midnight Express, Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane, for the NWA United States Tag Team titles. These belts were soon renamed the WCW United States Tag Championships as World Championship Wrestling rebranded all their championships that they owned. These belts were vacated when the Steiners won the WCW World Tag Team titles in February of 1991. The Steiners once again defeated the fabulous Freebirds during this title change. The taped match was aired on the March 9th episode of WCW Pro Wrestling and it is available to view online thanks to the excellent Monsoon Classic YouTube channel. Before this match though, the Steiners had an awesome bout against the Nasty Boys at Halloween Havoc 1990, something I talked about already in my Nasty Boys video, but it should be mentioned again on this video. It's a testament to how good the Steiners were that they got this show stealing match out of Jerry Sags and Brian Knobs. On March 21st, 1991, WCW and New Japan Pro Wrestling put on their first co-promoted Super Show in the Tokyo Dome. Known as the WCW Japan Super Show 1 to Western audiences, and known as Starcade in the Tokyo Dome to Japanese fans, the Steiner brothers picked up their first IWGP tag titles in a match where the WCW tag titles were also on the line. While the Steiners would eventually drop the titles later in the year, they did win the belts back in an absolute barn burner in June of 1992 against Big Van Vader and Crusher Bam Bam Bigelow. This match holds up extremely well by today's standards and is loads of fun to watch. Hunt this one down, it is available online. Anyway, we are getting slightly ahead of ourselves so let's just jump back to 1991. After their first IWGP title win back in WCW, Scott Steiner was beginning to get groomed for a singles run. This, however, further exposed Scott to the politics of WCW. On January 30th, 1991, Steiner had a WCW World Heavyweight Championship match against Ric Flair at Clash of the Champions 14. Scott says that Ric Flair purposely sabotaged this match doing all he could to make Scott look bad and, in turn, put an end to his singles push. The match indeed was very poor, ending in a time limit draw which meant Flair held on to the world strap. Quote Scott, We had the Clash of the Champions match and they were going to put the belt on me at a later date. During the match, he sat down on me, meaning Flair was sandbagging him, and I was too green to realise what he was doing at the time. He didn't want to give the belt up. Interestingly, Lance Storm also believes Ric Flair purposely sabotaged this match. Lance said, I watched the Clash of the Champions match between Scott and Rick, and I remember hearing stories of how Scott was getting over huge and they were considering giving him a singles push. The match sucked. 
I remember watching it as a fan, but I also watched it recently with the eye of a worker. I think Ric Flair sabotaged him. I really do. I respect Ric, but I watched that match and I was thinking he was blowing Scott's spots and taking bad bumps to make sure he didn't get over. After the Flair match, the Steiner brothers continued to tag up but the team was temporarily disbanded when Rick suffered an injury in late 1992. Scott resumed his singles run by teasing a heel turn and even capturing the WCW TV title when he defeated Ricky Steamboat on an episode of Worldwide in September of 92. However, the brothers got into a contract dispute with then WCW Executive Vice President Bill Watts. Believing they were worth more than what Bill Watts was offering, Rick and Scott left WCW and signed with the World Wrestling Federation. In part 2, we will look at the Steiners in the WWF and their eventual return to WCW. But before then, it would be unfair to end this video here without talking about more of the Steiners best matches during their first WCW run. We already mentioned their matches against the likes of Doom and the Fabulous Freebirds, but honestly, you'd be hard pressed to find a bad Steiner Brothers match during the years of 1988 to 1992 in WCW. A match I highly recommend checking out is from the second WCW New Japan Super Show, where the Steiners main evented against Sting and the Great Muda. While it is only around 10 minutes long, it's also incredibly entertaining. The War Games match at Wrestle War 1991 is also incredibly fun to watch. It features Flan Brand Pullman, Sting and the Steiners taking on the Four Horsemen and Larry Sabisco. Sting and Lax Luger vs the Steiners at the inaugural Super Brawl pay per view has the fans going nuts during the entire bout. So much so that this match was awarded PWI's match of the year and it would be criminal not to mention the Steiners vs the Road Warriors at Starcade 89. This match is all about power moves, stiff strikes and no selling but that's what makes it great. Fire up the WWE Network and search for Steiner matches of this era. Even if their opponents weren't marquee superstars, the Steiners were usually still doing some insane ring work that will surely keep you entertained. <laughs>